Good morning, church. Welcome. So glad you've joined us this morning. So glad you found us online. If this is your first time, we want to say a special welcome to you and say thank you for joining us. We invite you to click on the digital connection card up here in the corner and let us know you're here and uh, maybe how we can pray for you. And if this is your spiritual home, we say welcome to you too. And so grateful that you found time this morning to be part of our online experience. We'll remind you that we'll be in person in the building at 10 a.m. And today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of uh, Holy Week. And so we will invite you to uh, be part of some activities here in the community, one in particular on uh, Friday, Good Friday. Uh, Linden Road, along with many of our other churches, have partnered together for a virtual Good Friday experience. It will actually be uh, on our uh, this platform here, live.lindenroad.church. Uh, it'll also be available on other church websites, and we'll premiere it here at live.lindenroad.church at uh, 12 noon. And it'll be rebroadcast at 7 p.m., and then it'll be available and we'll, uh, would encourage you to be a participant in that just as we begin that most important celebration of Jesus offering his life for us and what we will celebrate next Sunday as uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter. But we also want to remind you that next Sunday we'll be collecting our uh, monies for the Presbyterian Mission Agency and as you can see we've already got some of the banks have been turned in. In fact, I think a couple of folks took more, a few more banks, and so we'll want to collect all that together next week. We'll be sending that off to be in partnership with the Presbyterian Mission Agency for the various ministries they support, clean water and disaster relief. And then I want to just say thank you to everybody that helped with our uh, amazing experience yesterday at the uh, community uh, Easter drive through and uh, check out this video.
the line going the other way, all the way to trip. So what an amazing time uh, people had yesterday. So much fun and so grateful to your faithfulness here at the church. And uh, for those that did the hard work, uh, Dan and Lynn Feldman and Carolyn Fowler and Linda Sheldon and others who uh, put the bags together and just the, the blessing it was for our community. And would remind you that we have set up a special uh, page here on our webpage at lindenroad.church forward slash surprise. Each of the participants yesterday as they picked up their bag actually got a cool wristband that had uh, that URL on it. And there's some opportunities there over the next week for people to lean into a family experience for this time of Easter. And so grateful that we can be part of that. But let's begin our time of worship with some music. Today we're going to examine that entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and it's one that we'll never forget, but it's also not what anyone expected. And we're going to take a look at what I mean by that. I mean, we're going to look at three different groups, three different major players and, and, that are in this story, 
And then I want to give you three simple lessons that we can take from this when Jesus makes an entrance into our own lives. Because the reality is sometimes things happen in life and we just don't expect Because sometimes things happen in our lives that we just don't expect. And then there are things sometimes that just don't go the way that we expect them to. And so with this triumphant entry of Jesus, when he comes into Jerusalem, with all the crowds and the people waving the palm branches and shouting Hosanna, there's three groups in this story. There's the crowd, there's the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and there's the disciples. And they are all part of this event. But yet, they each have a different perspective and understanding. And this grand entrance didn't turn out quite the way any of them expected in their own way. They sort of had the right idea, but the truth is they all missed it. And so let's hear from one woman and what she experienced that day. I was there that day. There were so many people there. But it wasn't that. Jerusalem. What a city it is for people and crowds. And it wasn't even the procession, the parade. These last two years, there have been so many parades, trails of stumbling, lisping, broken, drooling people, rolled, pushed, carried, slung, hoisted to him, Yeshua. No one would dare to believe in healing, except it was happening to everyone, even the sorriest among them. Everyone became like newborn, legs straightened and muscles strung right. Women who were mute, now they are singing and adding a little dance too. And crippled men are running and leaping. So, yes, we've been watching these parades for many months now. But this time, they finally saw who he was. Everyone ran to pull down branches from the trees, which means victory, triumph. When was the last time we were victors of anything? And we all took off our cloaks our outer robes, and just laid them at his feet and at the feet of the donkey he was riding. We knew what we were doing because, finally, we all saw it. He was the king. He was the one we've been waiting for since, since we were a people. And the singing, everyone was happy. We are not We have not been happy people, but this day, Hosanna, Hosanna. Children singing and old men, my grandpa, the young mothers, everyone, cheering, laughing, shouting, Hosanna. And you know what Hosanna means, yes? It means, please save us, save us. Finally, a king to lead us, to lead our people. We can be a nation again, not servants and slaves to the Romans. And we said, we turned to one another. All my friends, my neighbors, my cousins, we were all standing and shouting together. And we said, we will follow him anywhere, even into battle. But we didn't. We could not guess what would happen next. And if we had, no one would have been there that day. But I saw it. How those same people, not all of them, but some of them, my neighbors, my relatives, my uncle and cousins, They were there just days later. How many days? They were shouting again, just yelling this time, not singing and not waving palm branches, but waving their fists and shouting, crucify him. 
How did this happen? From oh save us our king, our king, to crucify him, blasphemer. How? But maybe I know. They wanted a king, a man king, who acted like a god. They didn't want a king who was God. They never really wanted God at all. I wonder how many of us want God to enter our world and become king over our lives. We think foolishly that we will give up too much. But here is what I know now. That day of singing and celebration and triumph was true and real, more real and more true than anybody ever knew. Hosanna! Praise to the King! Oh, save us! We shouted. And then, very quietly, through lashes and fists and nails, he did. So this is the big day. Jesus is making his grand entrance into the city and people would wave their palm branches and they would shout Hosanna. I mean, the truth is it's a traditional greeting. It's something that they had done before for other national heroes or uh, maybe a conquering king that had come into the city. Basically, the waving of palm branches means uh, victory. But as we look at this first group, the crowd, the people that are there that are waving the palm branches, you know, I want to offer that they had a perspective about What's in this for me? I mean, the truth is most of the people there, I don't think were looking for a savior from their sins. They, they weren't looking for someone to save them from their sins. They were simply looking for someone who could get the Romans off their back because they were tired of the Roman rule. And they knew they had heard of this guy, Jesus, and they had heard of the miracles he had performed. And so they thought maybe he was the guy that would be able to lead in a whole new political sort of way. So they grabbed the palm branches and they start waving and start shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here in John chapter 12 it says, they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. But it isn't too much longer in the, that moment where as the crowd is doing their thing, that all of a sudden the game shifts because they realize they're not really sure that Jesus is going to accomplish what they want. And the next thing you know, they're telling a little later here in John chapter 19, that they wanted to take him away because uh, and saying to crucify him. And so what this shows us is that many times, you know, we're all self-centered. You know, what do I get out of it? What's in it for me? And, and the problem with that is that when we start thinking about what's in my own interest, uh, my self-centeredness, if you will, it actually leads us to a, a deception. Uh, I mean, we all have a, a propensity for it. It's called human nature. Uh, even the Apostle Paul reminds us that, you know, that as Christians, we're living in the tension between, in almost a war between our flesh and our spirit to be all that God wants for us. So we, we have this tendency to be self-centered and that self-centeredness then leads to deceiving ourselves and we can't really see and understand what we need or why we need it because we're so focused on what we want and we want it now. Uh, and so then as we look at the religious leaders here, uh, these guys, they should have known better they, they knew the prophecy, they knew the scriptures, they should have seen all of this coming and they didn't. Because even back in the book of Daniel, a book that they had, the prophet prophesied over 300 years earlier, almost to the exact date, that there would be a Messiah entering into the city. And you would think that they would have been paying attention to that, almost having a calendar marking off the days, right? Um, till when they would show up. But they didn't see it, they missed it. Then in the Old Testament, there's actually a prophecy by the prophet Zechariah that Jesus would come, the Messiah, and he would actually come into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. And so my question is, how did they miss it? And so I think they missed it because they weren't in control of it. I mean, their perspective is, uh, I'm in control here, not you, Jesus, we are. And the religious leaders had a really good thing going. It was a racket. They didn't want Jesus to mess it up, you see. 
The Romans pretty much let them do all they wanted to do. Uh, they had some control over the Jews and the Romans kind of left them just do what they needed to do. But these religious leaders were scared of Jesus. We know that in the earlier stories in the Gospels. They were intimidated by him and they thought he was going to attempt a political coup. And so they thought he was going to really mess up a good thing they had going and, and, and they were in control. Uh, in fact, the Pharisees said in John chapter 12, verse 19, the Pharisees said to each other, we've lost, look, the whole world has gone after him. And, and the reality is, is that when we have a desire for control, it creates in us, as it did in them, an unteachable heart. Because when we want to be in control, it, we have this moment that we think we know what's best and we understand it correctly and everyone else is wrong. I mean, even though they knew the scriptures, uh, these, these religious leaders, these Pharisees, they should have known these things, they didn't. And, and the truth is they were unteachable. They had a hardened heart because they insisted on being in control. And, and so we go from the crowd to the religious leaders to the disciples and, and their perspective was not like this. And what I mean by that is they were surprised because they were sort of thinking that Jesus was gonna take charge. I mean, let's look at the disciples and what they understood. I mean, these guys uh, had walked with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They had made a commitment to follow him and his teachings and his work. But all through their experience with Jesus, Jesus had, in some regards, had actually been holding them back. <clears throat> and what I mean by that, it's interesting that when Jesus healed the lepers, remember that story, Jesus heals the lepers, and then he tells them, the disciples, go tell the priests, but then say nothing to anyone else. Or as we looked a couple weeks ago at the story of when he healed Jairus' daughter, uh, it's amazing as he's leaving the room where with those people who were there, he basically says, shh, there's, there's a reason to talk about this, be quiet. And then when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration where he had met with Elijah and Moses with some of his disciples, he says what? Say nothing to no one. Do not talk about what you've seen this day. And so in some regards, Jesus was holding them back. But the reason was is that Jesus says that his time hadn't yet come, that Jesus was telling them, it's not time yet. My time hasn't come. But they come walking into Jerusalem with people waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. The disciples looked around saying, this is awesome. And then the Pharisees say to Jesus, you need to shut these people up and make them keep quiet. They shouldn't be saying these things about you. And Jesus, you need to make them stop. And because they had seen Jesus do this before, they sort of expected Jesus to make them stop. But what's interesting is Jesus actually looks at them and says, nope, not gonna do it. Let them sing my praises. In fact, if they don't sing my praises, the very rocks we stand on will. And I have to admit that I think the disciples at this point were losing their minds because they're thinking, this is what we've been after, right? They were all excited. And when I were with them, I think I might be walking back to, to talk to the Pharisees and say, hey, master, uh, shut these people up. And Jesus said, nope, I'm not going to do that. I'd be like, what? You can't handle this. I'd be actually talking pretty crazy, I think. I, I think I've, I've thought about this situation. I've put myself even in it. I, and I probably wouldn't be a very good disciple because these guys were out of their head, excited, because finally Jesus was letting them go. But then they weren't understanding and they weren't seeing the big picture. They were actually missing it too. And Jesus was making a grand entrance, but it wasn't quite what anyone expected because the crown that Jesus is going to wear had no jewels in it. The throne that he was about to take was not on this earth. And so the disciples, again, their perspective is not like this, not like this. They just didn't expect it to go this way. And in fact, here in Matthew chapter 16, there's a conversation between Jesus and Peter. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. And he would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Not like this can't happen. I know you have to come into your kingdom. I know that you're here to do a very special work, but it can't happen like this, Lord, not like this. And so we see these three situations and we see these three different groups of people. And I, I can see myself in each of them because in each of them, it's the result of a lack of trust in God's plan that leads them to being blind or a blindness, if you will. 
And it's blindness to what really matters. It's blindness to God's big picture. And the disciples were right. Jesus was the king of kings, but it wasn't in the way that they expected because much like the crowd, they thought Jesus was there to take up an earthly throne. That wasn't the point. They were thinking, not like this. Now, I know that our difficulties in life are, are the things we have to push through, our trials and tribulations. All these things produce the character traits that are necessary for us to live a fruitful and productive Christian life. But I have to be honest, a lot of times I don't want to have to go through what's necessary. I don't know about you, but because it's hard. I'd rather God just sort of insert them in me. Uh, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have a spiritual drive through where you sort of pull up here at the side of the church and leaders come out and say, what is it you'd like to have? And you'd say, well, I'd like to have some spiritual growth, please. Uh, could you help me get a little more patience and a little more grace? And But you can leave out, hold the tribulation. I don't want anything to do with that. Thank you. Well, it doesn't work that way. A lot of times in my own life, and I'm going to guess in yours, it's like, okay, God, I, I want to grow and I want to be close to you and I want these things to happen. I want a full life that you promised, but I'm not sure I want it like this. Not like this, like the disciples said. And even where you think about where we've been over the many months and the various things we've talked about here on, on our weekly gatherings is to be reminded that it's about our intimate time with God that's going to make life moving in the right direction. And yet all three of these groups, the crowd, the religious leaders, and the disciples, they all were there and experienced that entrance on that day in Jerusalem. They were there when Jesus came in, but all three of them didn't quite understand what it was, and it wasn't quite what they expected. So here's my question to you. Do you think you see yourself in any of these groups? I mean, I see myself. I can see myself in all three of them, as a matter of fact, on any given week. Uh, but there's something special that happens when Jesus makes an entrance into your situation. And that's what I want to talk about now. Sort of take, what does this mean, Palm Sunday mean for us? You see, when we have this beautiful story of showing what happens when Jesus shows up. And for us as Christ followers, when Jesus enters your situation, it's this first point here. Jesus will create a beautiful disruption. He creates this beautiful disruption, and, and when he enters in, he makes an entrance into the messiness of our lives, and all of a sudden creates ways for us to see things new. I mean, Jesus had a conversation with Peter and Andrew when they were fishing on the Sea of Galilee, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, before they had really leaned into serving him. Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, and these guys had a great business. They were doing just fine. But Jesus knew they wanted more out of life and they wanted to do something significant. And so Jesus created a disruption. Uh, in Matthew 4, 19, Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. I mean, that's always amazed me, that statement there. They left their nets at once and followed him. That's crazy. I mean, how do you do that? A lot of people would say, well, well let me get my details in order and I'll I'll show up next week. It's like, no, Jesus, they literally left in the moment. They were willing to put it all down. They knew there had to be more to life and more than what they were doing. The same old routine over and over, the same old pattern. Jesus comes into their life and says, I will offer you an opportunity to do something significant. Would you like that? They wanted it so badly that they left everything at once and followed Jesus. I mean, if you think about where we were before COVID, and what we've learned, I mean, we're on, what, day 390 of, of March of 2020, right? I mean, it seems like, when's this thing going to end? And yet before that, I think many of us were not really where we needed to be. And so COVID has sort of helped open up some new understanding of what it is that God's wanting to do in and through his people in the community. And the truth is, some of the habits that we had, the patterns we had, they weren't healthy. Some of those patterns and habits we had weren't productive and there's a, a word that I, I think we like to use you know we call it the same old same old uh, you know that we do the same thing same routine and, and sometimes we get stuck in a rut and I'd like to I'd like to offer a definition of rut it's just uh, I don't know if it's proper but I sort of like it it's this idea of having robotic unchallenged thinking that we just do the same thing without really thinking through that this idea of being just robotic in how we make our choices and what we do. And when I just naturally fall into the groove, into a rut, and I do the same thing over and over, sometimes that rut just gets ingrained and there's patterns that develop that are not healthy for my life. So let me go to a little meddling here this morning. I, let me ask you a question. 
If your life right now stays on its current path, on where it's headed, will you land on your God-given destiny or will you land further away? And I'm going to guess that even now that some of us are stuck in a rut and we're trying to figure it out, that you're in this robotic, unchallenged thinking. And when Jesus makes an entrance into your situation, when you invite Jesus to be a part of the obstacles, when you invite Jesus to be part of your problem, part of your life, it's amazing. He just comes in and disrupts it all. He shakes it up. And there have been many, many times in my life that I needed God to shake things up, to break me out of that simple rut, that robotic, unchallenged thinking. When Jesus enters your situation and when Jesus makes an entrance into your life, he creates a beautiful disruption that then leads to the second point, a whole new perspective. Your perspective is your reality. Your perspective is that framework through which you view the world and you interpret everything that happens. A lot of things go into the creation of this perspective. Your background, your childhood, your education, your travels, your life experiences, all these things and lots more, they all contribute to the construction of this perspective. It's the framework through which you see the world. It's amazing how that framework has such a massive impact on our thinking. You see, it's this. Our perspective should develop as our relationship with Jesus deepens. Again, here in John, his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered that what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Oh, now we get it. After Jesus had completed his mission, then their whole perspective changed. Their perspectives developed as it deepens. As their relationship deepens with Jesus, now they get it. Now they understand what was going on. Now they understand what Jesus was really there to do. So sometimes my perspective is somewhat like the crowd, right? Or like the Pharisees, or like the disciples. Sometimes my perspective is, Jesus, what am I going to get out of this, right? Why should I do this? Or what's in it for me? Sometimes my perspective is, I'm in control here, Lord. I got this. I got a pretty good plan. If you could just bless it, that'd be really helpful. If you could just make this thing happen, that would be great. And then sometimes my perspective is, come on, Lord, <laughs> really? Not like this, not like this. So it's this idea that when my relationship deepens, when my relationship deepens with Jesus, my perspective is developed and it grows and it matures. Now, here's what I need to say, too, is that there's something about perspectives that I think I understand, and that's that they must be framed in the context of faith and not with feeling. To be reminded our feelings are going to disappoint us. They're going to disillusion us. And so we really have to frame it all with faith. And then that takes us to this third point, that Jesus will offer you a Hosanna moment. And what I mean by that is that when Jesus makes an entrance, when we allow him to make an entrance into our lives and into our situations, our circumstances, he's going to bring this beautiful disruption, which is going to give us a whole new perspective and then Jesus is going to offer me a Hosanna moment. Jesus is going to offer me a moment to really know him in an intimate way. And you see, when the people were chanting Hosanna and waving the palm branches as Jesus came in, that expression has somewhat evolved over the years. When the people in Jerusalem were shouting the, to Jesus, it, it was just a greeting. It didn't mean much more than God save the queen or something like, like that. It was a greeting. But when you look at the world in the Arabic language, and when you look at what Hosanna really means, relief from the crushing weight, it's a combination of two words that speak uh, to an expansion of, or a giving room, or giving us space. They said, Hosanna, God save us, but that word means relief from the crushing weight. I mean, here in Matthew 26, Jesus had gone into the garden and he was praying. This is one of the most powerful verses in all of scripture. I mean, Jesus was praying and he in that moment realized what was about to happen. He in that moment realized that the sins of the world were about to be placed upon his shoulders. In that moment, he said, he told them, my soul is crushed with grief. Jesus knew in that moment what he was about to take on. It wasn't the physical torture or crucifixion that really vexed Jesus' spirit. That wasn't what, what he, where he was in the moment. That wasn't what he was afraid of. But make no mistake, he was afraid. He knew that when all the sins of the world, of all the people that were ever born before him or ever to be born after him, my sins, your sins, 
the sins of our children, the sins of our forefathers. He knew when he took on all of this on himself that they would create that then in that moment it would create a separation between him and the Father momentarily. And that was new territory for him. Because he talks about how he and the Father are one in this intimate relationship, but he knew in the moment as he, he was there in the garden, and it scared him to death. His humanity came forward. But he took the wait. He took the wait to create a Hosanna moment for you and me. And he knew that we couldn't carry it and that he had to. And so what this does is it gives us room to breathe. Matthew says here in chapter 11, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I mean, the reality is that sometimes life has the tendency to just gradually start to fall on us. We feel that crushing weight, and we all need a Hosanna moment. And when Jesus makes an entrance into your life and into your situation, he brings a Hosanna moment. He brings relief to all that pressure and he gives you room to breathe. And, and, but here's the key to the whole thing. And it's why we look at the story of Palm Sunday. The key to the whole thing is what you choose to give to Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't make forced entries. This Plato is you and me. So the question we want to ask ourselves is, if this is my life, how much of me am I surrendering to Jesus? Because you see, that's the key. And we see that's where Jesus ended up as he walks to the cross on Good Friday. So the key here is surrender. You see, when Jesus made his, his entrance into Jerusalem, he did so as an act of surrender. We see that in Matthew 26, when Jesus was praying in the garden, he says these words. He went on a little further and he bowed with his face to the ground and he cried, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. <clears throat> Jesus was willing to surrender himself to the father because he knew the father knew best. See, we all have this tendency to say, Jesus, I'll give you this much. And I'll handle this over here if you can handle this for me. But that's not the way to go because now Jesus has this to work with and it's not a whole lot, right? But Jesus will work with it because that's what I'm giving to him. He'll work with what you give him. But if you give him all of me, if you give him all of yourself, if you surrender all of yourself to him and you invite him to make an entrance into your life, an unforgivable entrance, he'll bring that relief and he'll give you room to breathe and you'll create something beautiful, right? Okay, well, maybe you can do something more with it. But you see my point? That Jesus comes and makes an entrance into your situation, and when he does, it may not be what you want. It may not be what you expect. But we have to see this, that it's everything that we need. When Jesus makes an entrance into my situation, when I invite him into those problems, those obstacles, it might not be what I expect, but in that moment, it's everything that I need. Maybe you're here online today as a guest and just checking us out, and you're not sure about this thing called Christianity or the Christian faith, and here's what I'm gonna tell you. This Jesus that made this unforgivable entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he is ready and prepared to make an entrance into your life that will change you forever. And the question is, will you let him make that difference? And it's a simple thing. You can invite him in. You can say, Father, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. Forgive me for my sins. I want to be on your team. I want to be a part of you. I commit my life to you. And if you pray that prayer and you mean it, Jesus will make an entrance into your life and he will change you forever. And I say to you, my brothers and sisters who are here, who are following Jesus, that maybe there's something right now in your life, a trial or difficulty, that you feel the weight of and it hurts. It's heavy and you need a Hosanna moment. This much I promise you, Jesus will bring you relief. He'll give you room to breathe, but the reality is you've got to surrender all of yourself to him, not part of it. He'll make an entrance into your life, one that you'll never forget. It might not be what you want, 
it might not be what you expect, but it's everything that you need. And so let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this life that you've given us. And we pray as we remember that Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago, that as you came into Jerusalem, we pray that you come into our lives new and afresh to encourage us. Jesus, thank you for that triumphal entry. Holy Spirit, take those moments and help us better understand. Help us to surrender those things that, that we need to surrender and to give all of ourselves to you. Thank you for the life you've given us, Jesus, and we pray it together now in your strong name. Amen. So let's continue our time of celebration with some music. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea billows roll Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for celebrating Palm Sunday. We invite you to join us in the building next week. We enjoy. We invite you to join us again here online at 9 a.m. next Sunday or in the building at 10 a.m. as we celebrate Easter Sunday, Resurrection morning. But be reminded that you've been blessed to be a blessing. Go forth and serve the risen Christ in his name. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.